Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning and good evening to all our fr friends around the world who are watching today's webinar. We're back again. Um, we're streaming on YouTube as well, and um, and you've joined us through uh, Zoom today. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brent Morgan. As you know, I'm a director of Rogers Reedy Australia. Um, who is Rogers Reedy? We always introduce these webinars about who we are, just in case we have some um, new friends here today. Uh, Rogers Reedy, we're a leading insolvency firm and turnaround firm in um, Australia, New Zealand and, um, and Asia. Um, we're the only Australian firm that has offices in um, all Australian states and territories. And we're very proud of that. So, and um, we have, uh, and we are part uh, of the BTG Global Advisory Group, um, which has over 100 partners and 60 offices around the world. And we're blessed because we actually have one of those partners here today. It's the first lunch and learn of um, 2021. And um, we had one in December, which went fantastic. We have over 200 people here today, subscribers that are online. Um, but what are we talking about? Well, we're doing something a little bit different today. Um, no insolvency. We've bored you enough for the time being. We're going to talk about something a little bit different, and that is what's transfixed the media um, around the world since November. Um, and um, we're not talking about the Australian cricket um, and the results. No, we're talking about uh, US politics. And we're talking about the battle for the White House um, and uh, the, the, the fight between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. It's, it's sort of, as we've said, it's been like a mini series and, um, and it's sort of playing out in the next 24 hours. So hence why we're having today's presentation. We've had lawsuits, we've um, had protests in Washington, D.C., got a second um, impeachment process that is happening. There were calls for the president to resign. That's not happening um, and, and, and it won't happen before um, tomorrow's big day. Um, but we've got our own BTG Global Advisory expert. He's our political analyst. He, his real job. I mean, he is, he is, he has a real job and, and that, that is basically Wayne Wheats, who is um, Senior Managing Director at uh, B Riley Advisory Services, um, who is one of our, is our USA um, partner. And Wayne is talking today on everything US when it comes to the election. Um, he's going to educate us. He's going to educate everyone that's uh, attending here today about the US election, about the um, electoral college process, about the Trump's lawsuits. Um, he's going to talk about the pardons. He's going to talk about the second impeachment. Um, and he's going to talk about Supreme Court nominations. These are just some of the things. So that's why we've got Wayne here today and we're looking looking forward to it. If we have some time, we can we'll have a, a bit of a chat. We'll have a bit of a chat about um, how this is going to impact Australia. Um, and so if we've got a bit of time there, I'll, I'll briefly sort of run down um, how that's going to happen. If you have any questions of Wayne today, um, you know, with Zoom, you have the option to type some questions. Um, we'll be monitoring those and um, and we'll, you know, can ask Wayne at the end about those sorts of questions. We, we tend not to take you any longer than an hour today. So we'll, we'll have you out by lunchtime. So fantastic. Wayne, good evening. I know it's it's late um, in the US at the moment. Um, where are you today? Are you in Washington? Are you in New York? I know you're in New York office. That's where you're based. I, 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 where are you? Um, yesterday was Washington. <clears throat> today I'm, I'm back in Philadelphia. Uh, so between New York, Philadelphia, Washington, we have three important cities right near each other. On the same coast that I get to spend time in, um, was, was helping my son actually move into a new apartment in Washington yesterday, which happens to be located on Massachusetts Avenue, which is the border of the lockdown zone. So he, for the next couple of days, can't walk out his front door. He has to go out his back door. That's how close he is to the security lockdown. But what I do want everybody to know before we get into the broader presentation is 
that what you see on television is not representative of, of greater Washington or even the people who live there. You can't get to the monument areas, but we went shopping at Costco yesterday and despite COVID concerns and everything else, it was packed. So what you're seeing is a, a, a capital city under siege. That's the media playing it, not only for the world stage, but even for the US stage. So how close can you get, Wayne? How close can you get to the inauguration? I mean, can you can you get on the mall? Can you, can no, the mall, the mall is closed. Um, everything around the mall is is closed. Everything around the major monuments is closed. Um, if you were on the south side of, <clears throat> of my son's building, he looks north, so he doesn't see it. But if you go up to the roof deck, you can see the Capitol. So perhaps from some of the buildings you'll be able to see. But rest assured, there's security in place on top of all of those buildings. There's not going to be a lot of in-person live viewing. And the unfortunate thing about Washington is this is a time of year once every four years that's a celebration. It's a celebration of of either a renewal of a president being sworn in for a second term or a peaceful transition of power. And to see Washington, even though, as I said, Costco was busy, the mall was empty. You can't walk around the monuments. This is typically, hotels are usually busy, restaurants are usually busy, and you have families and people there to experience history once every four years, and, and that that's not happening. Well, I, I, I suppose, so historically you could, you know, sit in the mall and watch from a distance and you, you could, watch could sit York. on the mall and watch the Capitol steps. Oh, really? Fantastic. I suppose that explains why Donald Trump's not going because he couldn't do that. Is that, is that right? And I suppose one of the key things we do want to do, we don't want to ali want you alienating 50% or 100% of your um, client base. So we're not going to be political. We're, we're, we, we, we're not going to be political. We're not going to make commentary on Biden, Trump, anyone else. Um, I think it's safe for, for all, um, you know, for Australians, um, you know, it's important to note that, that um, you know, that uh, there is a divide um, and um, we're not going to ask you to provide any political comment because we don't want that. We just want an education. So. Very good. That's great. Thanks. And just to echo that, I just want to be on record. I know we're recording this and broadcasting. Um, anything I say tonight, reflects my views. We're going to keep it not sharing views. If something inadvertent slips in, I want everybody to know that I'm speaking for me, not representing B. Riley, BTG, or Rogers Reedy. Um, and with that, I, I appreciate it. We can we can jump in. Okay. Um, so it's already inauguration day in Australia, sort of. For you, it's now noon on January 20th which is the exact moment prescribed by the US Constitution for the inauguration of the president every fourth year. So there's something symbolic, although we here have 16 hours left to go. The genesis of this conversation really took place two weeks ago on January 6th, which was a very odd day in the US. What should have been a simple, straightforward and largely administrative process led to an attempted takeover of the US Capitol in the mid afternoon followed by the Senate coming back into session a few hours later. Very, very symbolic about the resiliency of our, of our system here. And we'll talk about that. But the question arises, what was going on that day? And how do we get to such an uncivil moment? And why is January 6th important when we have an election in November and we have an inauguration in January? What goes on in, in the middle? In fact, what leads up to it? So today we're gonna to talk about the branches of the US government how they interact, how Americans vote for presidential candidates, because we have some oddities to that system and it is not a direct election of the president. What happens between election day and inauguration day and why is it not always as straightforward as people expect? Um, in the time between the election and now, or and the January 6th, what were President Trump's structural objections not philosophical, but structural. What happened on January 6th and how and when can a president be removed? So there's a lot there. And then at the end, we'll touch a little bit about sort of presidential powers um, in the Supreme Court and in pardoning and, and how all of this comes together with control of the houses. But if we put the first slide up, few general concepts. First, it's important to know that 
the United States is a federal republic of 50 states. Lots of decisions are made at individual state levels, similar to in Australia. So for example, decisions with, with COVID, while there is a federal focus on, on, on giving information, a lot of policies and decisions are made at the state level. And that permeates everything that we do. We have a federal government, and then we have 50 state governments plus certain territorial governments. At the federal level, our constitution has an incredible system of checks and balances between three branches. The legislative, which is then further split between a lower house and an upper house, the judicial, and the executive. They're each distinctly separate from each other. They have lots of interaction. It's important though to understand the, the concept of an independent executive who does not come from the legislature. Because in some senses, it, it's a throwback and a vestige to, to, a, to a, a supreme, I don't want to say monarch, though there was talk in the early days of the Republic about instead of having a president, having a king. But when the, the constitution was written 250 years ago, the president, the House of Representatives, the Senate, and the judiciary were all established and the interaction, the checks and balances. So as we said, the president is not elected by the people, but by electors, we'll discuss that in a moment. And the voters vote for electors in accordance with 50 different states of election laws. But that's only once we get to the general election. So let's go back a little bit. We can go to the next slide. This is a picture of the presidential election process that starts at the primary level. For all intents and purposes and for discussion here, we have two major political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Historically, the Democrats were the left-leaning, liberal, progressive. The, conserv the Republicans were the right-leaning, conservative. And there historically has been crossover and those roles have changed over time. But for simplification, we have Democrats, we have Republicans. The primary process starts almost a year in advance of the November general election to, to winnow down the candidates. And again, the candidates don't come from our legislature. They don't represent a party. Any individual can run for president by first running for his party's nomination. And seemingly every Tuesday from February through June, there's a single party primary election at the state level. Candidates are seeking to win delegate votes. Those delegate votes then go to nominating conventions, which take place in July or August, depending on the party and the year. And that's where the nominee is officially selected. In recent years, the nominee has been effectively determined well before the conventions. Many states bring their campaigns up further. The, the problem that happens all the time, every more in recent years, in the primary process is each party fills the stage with a large number of candidates. In recent years, it's been 12 to 16 viable candidates for each party, and they spend the primary process beating each other up. So they want to get their party's nomination, but in the process, they're sharing with the world everything bad about the guy who's eventually gonna get that nomination, which has implications for the general election. You haven't coalesced around your leader, you've beaten him up tremendously. Um, in recent years, these are done before the convention, and then the conventions really serve as coronations and kickoff parties and four day long political advertisements that are broadcast by all the television, the television stations. So then we go to the general election, um, which you can see uh, general election and then electoral college, but let's go to the next slide for a moment. And what you'll see here is you'll see 50, 51 actually <clears throat> separate maps. So on election day, American voters, if you keep this map in mind, we can take this down, but I just want everybody to see that each state has a number and that number is the number of electoral votes that each state has. How is that determined? The number of electors equals the number of senators, which in all cases is two, plus the number of representatives in the House of Representatives, um, but not less than one. So you can see some of the states in the upper Midwest that say three, that's because they have two senators and one congressman. In Texas, for example, there's 38 because they have 36 congressmen plus two senators. And then the District of Columbia, which is a federal district that does not have any con congressional representation, 
by statute has three electors. So if we take this down, let's talk about what's happening with the electors. When voters go to the polls um, to vote on election day, they're not voting for a candidate. We're voting for an elector in that state who will then go on to vote for a candidate in a meeting of what's called the electoral college. So in all but two states, every electoral college vote is winner take all. If you win the popular vote in that state, you get all of that state's electoral votes. So California with 55 is very important. Texas with 38 is very important. And you have the concept of, of some states, the, the California is overwhelmingly voting Democrat. Texas isn't so sure. Pennsylvania, large state, is right on the cusp. And so there are states that could go either way. Florida is another swing state. So the focus tends to be on the larger swing states. The smaller states don't matter as much. And the states that are not contested because they're very clearly leaning towards one party or another don't matter as much. So in the course of the election, you hear lots of focus on swing states. And when we come, when we go further, when the president was challenging the votes, he was challenging votes in Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, all three votes, all three states where if you can switch one of those, you could have changed the outcome of the election. So you need to win 270 electoral votes on election day to have a majority of electors. Each state then is required to certify the results of its election by, mid, by, by a certain date in November. And then the electoral college meets in each of the 50 states plus DC in December. And at those meetings, each group of electors votes for its candidate. There's controversy over time about does the elector, must the elector vote for the candidate who he was elected to vote for, or can he vote his conscience? And those are called faithless electors. And many states have, have, have rules and some states making it a felony to be a faithless elector. And those rules were actually upheld by the court this year. Um, so the electoral college meets in each state, they cast their votes. There's not a lot of surprise, not a lot of drama. And all of the votes get put, get brought to Washington DC for the first week of January. That brings us to January 6th. So on January 6th, Congress meets which is both houses in a joint session, all the, the congressmen and the senators, 435 members of the House of Representatives, 100 senators. The president of the Senate, who also happens to be the vice president of the United States, opens the ballots from each state. This is what was happening when the riots started two weeks ago. President Trump had asked Vice President Pence, as he's reading these votes, to claim that the electoral votes were invalid. Prior to the 6th, there was a court case that was filed on the 4th and 5th to ascertain whether the vice president had the power to change or whether his role was simply ceremonial. The court said, no, the role is ceremonial. He can moderate the discussion. He does not have the power by himself to invalidate any state's votes. But the Constitution does lay out a challenge process. Every time, and some of you may have been watching this on television, um, either that, either then or later in, in the evening or the next day your time, to challenge a state's electoral votes requires one senator and one member of the House of Representatives to stand in, in opposition. And if you have one of each of those, then the counting stops, the chambers, the two bodies go back to their chambers, they have a period of time in which to debate, and then each the Senate and the House vote on whether to accept or not accept the votes of that state to certify that state. So the morning starts, Arizona comes up, there's an objection, a senator and a, a congressman, they go into session. And this was all theater. This is important to understand. This was all theater because the Democrats control the House of Representatives. So there was no scenario at that point in time that was going to be able to overturn any of these for any reason, even if the Senate voted to reject Arizona or Georgia or Pennsylvania, the House of Representatives would never have 
voted to overturn that state. So the, the drama would have played out. And part of the drama that was happening was an attempt to delay the process, stall the process, get the talking points out in the public, because it should take approximately four minutes for each state's name to be called, the perfunctory, this is what the Constitution says, are these the ballots that you brought? Yes, okay, and no objection, you move on. But if you have 15 states that you're going to object to, or 20 states that you object to, that then leads to 40 hours of debate, plus the time it takes to convene and adjourn each chamber and the logistics, because you never get it done in two hours. That was really what the strategy was, extend this and, and, and just make people aware and aggravate people a little bit. It was during the morning that there was a rally near the Capitol. The president spoke, some of his advisors spoke, and he made some remarks that are viewed as incendiary and sort of encouraged his crowd to take back the Capitol and prevent this from happening. Whether he was speaking euphemistically or whether he was giving direct order doesn't really matter. Whether there was a plan, there's, a, there, there's now a lot of news that this was planned, regardless of the president's speech, that there were groups coming to Washington for the purpose of disrupting the counting. Doesn't matter, it happened. The Capitol Police were not sufficiently prepared. Uh, armed people got into the Capitol. Um, and in, in a period of live television, it's a, it's a very frightening prospect to see armed people in face paint in the US Capitol sitting in the office of the Speaker of the House or sitting at the podium for the President of the Senate. Um, the, the, the good news here is that once the senators, the congressmen, the vice president were all put in secure areas and once the Capitol Police took back the Capitol, there were a few hours of uncertainty. The Senate went back into session at 8 p.m. This may, I will put an opinion out here on this, this may prove down the road when history is written to be one of the most important things that happened in the United States. That the Senate saw it as sufficiently important to get back into session and to continue Democrats and Republicans, the counting process and see this through. Back in session at eight o'clock, the other upshot of what happened was in all but one case, Every state where the senators were going, where there was a senator who was ready to object, the senators backed down in full. There were still some states where congressmen, members of the House of Representatives, raised their objection. But every time the vice president said, do you have a senator? They said no. They said then the chair can't consider the objection, and they moved on. Pennsylvania, they had one senator who raised an objection. They went back. They had a discussion. Same result as Arizona, but he was the only senator the rest of the day that raised any objection. Ultimately, at 3.30 in the morning, uh, Joe Biden's election was confirmed by Congress. During this period, particularly leading up to here, following the election, the president was bringing lawsuits. And this is where it's, it's interesting to see how all the different parts of the government interact. The president had the opportunity to name a third Supreme Court justice when, when Ruth Bader Ginsburg died just a few weeks before the election. And the president hurried up and, and exercised his right. And then the Senate, a little bit controversial for some historical reasons, instead of deferring and leaving the nomination or leaving the, the nomination for the next president, confirmed Amy Coney Barrett. And there was a lot of talk that said that the president had picked somebody to make sure that if any election decisions reach the Supreme Court or if the entire election challenge reach the Supreme Court, he would have his conservative justices, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Kavanaugh, and Justice Barrett all lined up to do whatever was necessary to keep him in power. Interestingly, when you look at all of the judicial challenges for whatever reason, over votes in, in, in Georgia, in Arizona, Pennsylvania, uh, federally, the president didn't win a single one of these. The judiciary that he had appointed decided for right or wrong that the process was more important. And everyone, both sides of the aisle, not everyone, but both sides of the aisle were saying there has been no evidence of actual fraud. There's allegations, there's suspicion, there's no evidence of fraud. The Attorney General of the United States, who's part of the executive branch, said 
that the Justice Department found no evidence of fraud. So what was the president making his argument about, if not about absence of fraud? This gets back to the 50 states and the 50 state laws. Because if you recall, we said that in the United States, I, I'm a resident of Pennsylvania. I don't vote for the president, I vote for an elector. But how I vote for that elector is governed by the laws of Pennsylvania. The people in California have different laws about how they vote for the elector. That may sound a little crazy. What's he talking about? What could be different? You go to the polls, you vote. Some states allow mail-in votes. Some states allow early voting. You can go to a polling place two weeks before. Some states allow votes of military to be counted for a week later. And on top of all of this, this year we had COVID. So it raises the interesting question about in a state like Pennsylvania, I can talk about sort of what, what happened in Pennsylvania. The Pennsylvania Constitution doesn't provide for late counting of ballots and doesn't provide for mail-in ballots. But the legislature in Pennsylvania passed laws providing for mail-in ballots and extending the period of time in which ballots could be counted. Why does this matter? Well, if we're in a period for COVID, and remember, this was happening June, July, August, when we still had, we still have uncertainty, but when the COVID concern, are we ever going to go out of our houses was happening. So people said, how are you going to go to the polls? As it turns out, people didn't have a problem going to the polls and you had lots and lots of people voting at the polls. But certain states said, if we don't already have mail-in voting, let's have mail-in voting. Historically, mail-in voting and early voting has been more heavily Democratic voters. Walking to the polls has been more heavily, Republic on election day has been more heavily Republican voters. So one could create a scenario that says, the reason why this was being done was to encourage more Democratic voters to vote. Um, my view of the world is crazy times demand crazy measures. And even in the insolvency world, I can point to bankruptcy cases where judges made decisions that weren't exactly in accordance with the bankruptcy code because it needed to be done. And I think when you look at preservation of the system, making some tweaks to the legal to the, the process of voting in a time of COVID was viewed by the legislatures and subsequently by the courts as more important because the president didn't go in and say there was fraud. He went in and he was saying, well, he was out alleging fraud, but he was saying in these lawsuits that the entire vote of the state of Pennsylvania should be eliminated from consideration. And this is what he tried to have the objection during the counting as well, the entire vote should be thrown out because the legislature changed the law in violation of its own constitution. I think you're going to see some revisiting of how we elect our electors. And there are certain proposals that say, if you want to elect your congressman with state rules, you want to elect your local leaders with state rules, fine. But if you're electing your electors for the president, there should be one set of rules. We'll see what happens there. We'll also see movements now to see who had, does Pennsylvania, for example, have the ability to change its election laws in violation of its constitution without changes to the constitution. So that's a little bit on the lawsuits that went on. Um, that led us up to the president trying to make the case of illegitimacy. Um, the president giving a speech that one way or another led by an hour of a large people, number of armed people storming the Capitol. Subsequent to that, and that even that evening, there immediately became calls to remove the president. The president should be responsible. It took a long time till the president spoke um, that evening saying we shouldn't be violent. Um, but there's never any direct repudiation. There's never any I'm responsible, I shouldn't have said that, you all need to stand down. It's always dancing along the edges as politicians do. So there was a view that says the president needs to go. We only have two weeks, but he needs to go. There are several, there were three ways that were raised how we, how, we, how our process works for the removal of a president in those two weeks. Number one would be 
the 25th Amendment, which provides for the removal of a president um, at the, uh, in the event of incapacitation as judged by his cabinet. Second is through impeachment and conviction. And third is through resignation. So in the first few days, and I could tell you as, as an American voter um, who uh, is enthralled um, but distressed by the 24 hour news cycle, it's been interesting to watch the news coverage from, from both sides. And, and we have very polarizing news coverage in this country. So you really do need to switch back and forth to try and understand two sides of the argument. But it's been interesting to see the arguments going forward. Why should the president resign? The president should resign. He can save face. He can help himself. This president really, that's not in his DNA. So that really resignation wasn't going to happen in the last two weeks. So the next option became the 25th Amendment. And the House of Representatives, um, the House of Representatives voted a resolution, which is a non-binding resolution, asking the vice president, who had who has since in the last two weeks really has been running the cabinet meetings, to initiate a process in the cabinet to invoke this amendment to declare the president incompetent to serve and remove him. And the vice president said, no, this is not the condition for which the 25th Amendment was meant. And we have two weeks and we need to talk about unity, not disunity. This will ride off. And the vice president was very instrumental in, in saying right away, the election was legitimate. Power will change. Power will hand, be handed over. I'm not going to invoke the 25th Amendment. That left the third choice, which was impeachment. And initially, there was discussion that said, if you move fast enough, you can impeach and convict within two weeks. The challenge that creates is, does that make this hold somebody accountable? And, and by the way, the charge of impeachment was for creating the insurrection that led to the taking over of the Capitol. Um, if you hurry through an impeachment vote and then a conviction, does it really, does it look too political? Was it politically motivated? Is there time to really have a hearing on the charges and then have a fair trial? And what's happened in this period was the Speaker of the House realized that it wasn't going to be able to happen that quickly. So last Tuesday, there were the hearings on on, on the impeachment. And then later in the week, the impeachment was, was voted on. So President Trump became the first person in US history to ever be impeached twice. And the next step is for the articles of impeachment to go to the Senate. So what happens is, think of the, the, the House as the grand jury who votes on the indictment. And then once the indictment happens, the trial begins, the senators are the jury and members of Congress picked from picked by the Speaker of the House become the prosecutors. They're called managers, but they effectively become trial prosecutors and the Senate becomes the jury. It's 100 jurors. And you need two thirds vote to convict. So we say that the president is the first president ever to be impeached twice, but let's bear in mind that he's only the third president to be impeached ever. Andrew Johnson was impeached in 1868 and was he was he was impeached over the issue of trying to to remove a member of his cabinet against the law back then and his conviction failed by one vote they actually had 11 articles of impeachment against him they voted on three of them each of them failed by one and they terminated the trial and he was never convicted more recently bill clinton in 1998 was impeached but he wasn't impeached over doing something with his cabinet. He was impeached over obstruction of justice charges because he was charged with lying under oath in the inquiry about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. Now, this, this, it's really interesting how you go from something having to do with the government, with, with role in the government to Clinton, which was a personal matter at its core but it was over his lying under oath, not over anything he did in his capacity as president. He too was not convicted. So then you fast forward to Donald Trump. And what we've done now is unlike Andrew Johnson, who 
you had coalescing of both parties and conviction failed by one vote. Or if you look at Richard Nixon in 1974 after Watergate, who was told by his by congressmen of his party and by others, Mr. President, the time is now for you to go because he knew he was going to be impeached. And it was bipartisan. Everyone agreed that what he had done was so egregious. So when you look at the, the and this is going to be a state of, of where the US political scene is, not any personal views, but when you look at the votes in the, in the Trump impeachment, the first one and the second one, the first one was the result of a long period of saying, we're going to find a way to impeach him. We're going to find something he does wrong. So there was an episode where there was allegedly a quid pro quo where he was offering to hold financial aid from, from a, a Ukrainian initiative, if not for the Ukraines agreeing to um, do an investigation into misdeeds against Joe Biden and his son. So that was the charge. And the president was not convicted on party lines. So it really, whether you agree with the charges or not, looked like it was a party line vote and a party line, um, it was a political impeachment. This impeachment has a lot of bipartisan support. And as we sit here today, the trial, the latest news as of today is that the Speaker of the House is expected to submit the articles of the article of impeachment to the Senate on Thursday of this week. And a trial would start on Friday. The Constitution requires the trial to start the day after the articles are submitted. And that will be opening arguments. Um, but this will go on for probably a couple of weeks. There's the view that says it has to really be a real trial because otherwise you have the possibility of giving the former president status as a martyr. So you do the trial. But what's been interesting over the last couple of days is the news is more Republicans are advocating conviction. More Republican senators are moving across and saying, yeah, maybe it's time. So we'll see what happens. Why is this so important closer to the end of the term? So a couple things. One, if he's convicted, which requires two thirds votes, there can then be another vote that only requires 50%, a majority, that can prohibit him from running for future elected office. That's pretty important because there's a fear that Donald Trump will again rally his, his base and say and declare there, there was talk last week that says that on inauguration day, President Trump was going to launch his 2024 presidential campaign. And that just means you have an ex-president really being a noisemaker for the next four years. Um, a noisemaker who um, is, is divisive even within his own party. And that's really not what American unity about the center has, has been. So there's, there's that possibility. The other reason to remove a president for doing something in the last two weeks of his term, even though he's going away, is the desire to have a precedent for how future pres presidents can act in the final days of their term. Everyone has to know that there will always be accountability right up until noon on the 20th of January. So you can't have a president say, I can go off the rails in my final weeks and do all of these executive orders and do all of these potential acts of insurrection with impunity because they're simply not gonna try me. So this will be the first time in American history that a trial goes on, an impeachment trial of a former president continues once he's no longer in office. So procedurally on the impeachment, the two week period between January 6th and 20th was simply too short a period of time to vote on the articles of impeachment, submit to the Senate and start and complete a trial. And it also had the ability, if you did that, did that, President Biden's cabinet nominations have started their hearing process. If we were in the middle of an impeachment trial, the first few weeks that never would have gotten started and the Biden administration would effectively have been doing nothing for the last two weeks. It was always going to be highly unlikely that the president could be removed before the Biden inauguration. So just two things real, real quick. If you put up the slide on the impeachment process, please, Sam. 
Okay, so so here we talked about the investigation, whether there's sufficient evidence, the House votes, and then majority vote, there's the impeachment, and the article is moved to the Senate, and there's the two-thirds vote and the removal. It's a little different this time because it's going to happen after the president leaves, but this is 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 an interesting simplification because what is sufficient evidence? And every step along the way, the Constitution lays out how this is supposed to work. And that to me is the most amazing thing about the resiliency of our system. Just two things to touch on at the back end. Okay, thank you. We could take a slide down, Sam. Um, presidential power and what happens in two arenas. One, the idea of, of pardons. With less than 16 hours to go, we're expecting to see, and unless it's come out in the last 45 minutes, as of when we came on, we're expecting to see between 60 and 100 names on a list. It was expected to be released Tuesday. We still have three and a half hours here um, in which to see that, we'll see. Pardons that are granted, the, the Constitution gives the president the ability to grant pardon, pardons for federal crimes. Um, there's been talk until Saturday night that the president might be looking to pardon himself proactively, prospectively, or pardon members of his family prospectively. But the advice the president received from his closest advisors on Saturday night said, if you do that, number one, you're going to be viewed as obstructionist unless you can point to specific violations that you think some of these people are being pardoned for. And you don't want to do that because then you're almost admitting their participation in these things. So the president now, the, the, the word is the president will not be pardoning himself. He will not be pardoning the members of his family. So good and bad, good as it would be another constitutional crisis because it's never been attempted and it would have to go through the courts. We'll, we'll avoid that for a few more years at least. Wayne, um, Wayne is, is, has there been any indication of that 60 to 100 names, exactly who we expect to be on there? Are they going to be known, known um, people? Um, well, are they there, there are, there are, it's interesting. There's several entertainers who were convicted of various crimes. There's going to be several political cronies. Um, there are going to be some people who have been in his administration um, Steve Bannon is a name I don't know if you're familiar with in Australia. Yep. Okay, you know Steve Bannon. So Steve Bannon was supposed to be on the original list, but now there's talk that Steve Bannon may have been involved in some of the chat rooms that led to the riots two weeks ago. So the president was advised, in fact, this was being discussed this morning, um, not to grant a pardon for Bannon because the president's trying very hard not to pardon anybody that may have been involved in the insurrection two weeks ago. So, so can you trying... can you pardon someone who actually hasn't been charged? Yes. Right. Yeah. So you can yeah. say you if, can if and you can done. do it, you can do it broadly. You could say immunity from all federal charges, or you could do it specifically. Typically, if it's prospectively, it's going to be from all federal charges because you don't want to say I'm pardoning him for this and then give federal prosecutors all the incentive to find all of these things that you didn't specifically pardon for. So you can do prospectively and you can do broadly. So if but, I did something in Vegas a number of years ago, I, I'd probably be best to call him shortly to add one more name on the list. Is... Yeah, it's probably too late. Too late. Um, but the other thing that's really interesting is there's there's you're going to see a lot of names on this list. There's a big movement to, to free wrongly convicted criminals. Right. There's the Innocence Project and a lot of celebrities are involved with that. We now have new evidence. And what I read a few hours ago is that there are going to be a bunch of names on this list who are the the people who have been convicted, who are the subject of work by celebrities and the Innocence Project and other things to prove their innocence. So the president is going to, you know, he's political. Right. So he's going to do a lot of things that progressives have been pushing for, and then he's going to say, look what I did for you. So it's going to be a broad, a broad list. Um, interestingly and importantly, this does not shield anyone from state criminal prosecution. Remember, 50 states plus some territories and districts, federal government. 
presidential pardon absolves you or protects you from federal crimes, not state. So for example, in New York, the New York district attorney is, is generally viewed as the top cop for white collar crime in the United States. And what he does is he doesn't investigate. You've got the, the, the district attorney for the city of New York. You've got, the, you've got the, the, the state's attorney. You have the federal attorney, but you also have the state's attorney there. And the state's attorney is continuing investigation into all sorts of financial wrongdoing by Trump, by the Trump administration, by lots of people close to him. So there's no immunity for anything from state prosecution. This will go on. The other thing just to talk about, um, about why all of this matters and how everything comes together is presidential power and Supreme Court nominations and fortunate or unfortunate timing. So Supreme Court nominees are nominated for life by the president. They're confirmed by the Senate. Currently, you only need a majority. It used to be that you needed 60%, except at some point, there was concern about one party blocking another and one party changed those rules as they could do and they made it 50%. So it used to be subject to the filibuster. Those rules are not there. Do you have a filibuster in Australia? Filibuster no, in the no. Okay, so what a filibuster means in the Senate is if I'm speaking on something, I have the floor without interruption until I'm done. So I could get up there and I could read Alice in Wonderland, the whole book into the congressional record. Until I stop my speaking and yield the floor, it's my floor, unless there's a vote of the Senate to end my filibuster. So depending on what is being discussed, filibusters for certain types of legislation, certain judicial appointments can only be ended with a two-thirds majority or 50%. So depending on how the Senate party in power changes the filibuster rules, a party in power, if, this, if the same party is the president and controls the Senate, there's tremendous power to change the nomination process. It turns out this president had three nominees. He had two justices die, one justice retire. Um, and, and this has been sort of what the Republicans have been aiming for for a long, long time. So their focus hasn't been as much win the White House until they knew they had the Senate and the House controlled. But this is, th this is a moment in time where a one-term president who's leaving with a 30-something percent, maybe it was 29% this morning approval rating, the lowest in history, had the ability. He'll be gone. He's gone after four years. But his legacy is that he named three Supreme Court justices. Now, to put everybody's mind at ease, Supreme Court justices historically have never been painted into a corner. You can go through most Supreme Court justices, even the last three, even President Trump's, and you can see decisions by Justice Kavanaugh, by Justice Gorsuch, and then Justice Barrett on the elections that, that they didn't vote the way the president expected them to vote. Um, justice Roberts was named Chief Justice, and instead of being a conservative He's been the moderate. He's been the swing vote. So the justices historically in this country have seemed to recognize their importance um, to the system and have been the glue that holds this system together. But I guess I'll wrap up now. But I, I think I, I hope I've taken you on a journey have, that says the way we elect presidents isn't as direct. We have an unbelievable system of documents that were prepared 250 years ago that continue to have relevance. They have rules. They have rules that most of us never, ever think about. But over the last month, they've played out. They've yeah. helped. And tomorrow at noon Eastern time, we will have a transition of power from one party to another. And we're more concerned with sort of insurgent disturbances um, that the police are tracking and on top of, but we're going to transition power. And just as the Senate came back in, it's going to be a new day. And I think that's, the system is amazing. Wayne, thank you. But it, we, we don't want you to leave yet. So we're just going to make a couple of comments. I'd like to get your feedback just about how we see the, the Biden um, 
administration presidency will impact Australia. But before that, I, I know is is um, Trump going ahead with his goodbye party, um, which I think is supposed to start very early tomorrow morning for yourself. Is that is that still occurring? President Where, Trump is President Trump is giving himself a military send off tomorrow morning at Joint Base Andrews which is the big military base near the White House where Air Force One is housed. Um, last I heard, he's expected to be going to Florida. Um, a lot of his moving trucks have started arriving at his house in Florida. Um, while at the same time, ironically, Mitch McConnell and, and the House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy, will be attending church services with Joe Biden. So yes. I think... When you talk about unity and the system and crossing over, Mitch McConnell has been friends with Joe Biden as senators since long before Donald Trump even knew that there was a president of the United States. And I think that that's happening. That really does become uh, a pretty important moment. Let the president have his send off with his military armor and let's see the Republican leaders and the new president praying together in the morning. I think that's yeah, pretty powerful. That's great. A uh, couple of comments. So, just the impact, and, and the you know the experts in Australia and are talking about what the Biden um, administration will have and what differences we're going to have. A lot of the views are that um, we're going to see the normality between the relationship, U.S. Australian relationships, um, come back to what it was prior to the the Trump period. Um, but I say that, but also you know during the Obama Biden um, period, um, Australia had um, a number of issues and clashed on a lot of trade agreements, um, particularly the um, Trans-Pacific um, proposal agreements. Um, so there's no suggestion that's going to change just because there is a, you know, there's a, a movement to, to Biden. But I think generally, you know, the world needs the US to, and the US and the American economy to fire up again. Um, I, you know, I think that's without doubt. Um, the tariffs, which has been, you know, probably gone on the back burner for some time. So when um, I know Trump came in and went hardline on a number of tariffs around the world, particularly with China, um, and took a hardline stance on um, steel and aluminium or aluminium, as, uh, as, your, as the American folks would say, Australia got exemptions during that period. So the thought is that, um, you know, that the issue is, is that because of Biden's um, climate change stance is that whilst the tariffs and the exemptions will, will stay in place to protect Australian exports of, um, of, Trump, of um, steel and aluminium, that because they're going to implement a carbon tax um, tariff on those sorts of um, imports. So then that will affect the Australian economy without a doubt. At the moment, I know we we're speaking about it today, but the you know the Australian dollar against um, US dollars sitting at about 78 cents at the moment. Last year, once COVID hit, it was you know sitting around 55 cents. You know, 55 cents is great for Australian exporters. Um, you know, 78 cents is, is not so great. Great if you want to buy shoes from uh, you know, Nike in the US. Um, and, um, great if you're traveling to the US and, and buying things, but that's not gonna happen anytime soon. So, you know, this this high Australian dollar against the US is not not great at the moment. Um, I note that, you know, Biden has pledged, um, you know, $2 trillion towards clean energy um, and it also passed, uh, I know that there's been um, some legislation passed recently where they put um, one and a half trillion into infrastructure projects in the US. There's a lot of talk about how that's going to uh, assist Australia um, and, and particularly with opportunities um, for uh, our infrastructure um, companies, um, Transurban, Macquarie, um, and, and basically a lot of the super funds that under, underwrite that. So, um, so that'll be interesting how that plays out. The, the, what do you think about the company tax? Is, he, is Biden expected to raise um, taxes, company corporate taxes in the US? Yeah, there, there's, there's an interesting concept, uh, I think, given, given our audience. Um, 
uh, I can say something and, and you'll understand. Um, at some level, companies don't pay taxes, people pay taxes. Companies don't really exist. Companies aren't sending their children to college. Companies aren't putting food on the table for themselves. The profits trickle down one way or another um, to people. Maybe they're wealthy people, maybe they're not. But there tends to be a view that says, if we raise taxes on companies, well, that's better than raising them on people. Let the companies pay a bigger share. And that tends to be embraced more by, by the Democrats. So yes, you're going to see Joe Biden looking to raise corporate taxes. You're also going to see Joe Biden look to raise individual income taxes on what they'll call the 1%, however they define it. So, so you will see corporate taxes going up, which, which will have an implication on, on the balance. Um, with regard to the environment, if I could just touch on that for one yes, second. Yes, that's, that's definitely. It's, it's, it's really interesting in this country and the, the, the Paris Climate Accords are always a hot topic. Um, and I know that there's a move to give Australia incentives to reduce your emissions. My concern here is from a competitive standpoint, I can only imagine given how much closer to China and India you are than we are. We talk sometimes here about, okay, we can feel good doing our share, reducing our emissions, um, but it's coming at a competitive cost because we're competing against Chinese and Indian polluters who, who aren't spending the money. And given that you compete with them much more closely geographically, that's got an impact. Domestically, one of the concerns becomes, it's wonderful to want clean energy and renewable energy. And it's, it's, it's admirable to say that coal causes problems, fossil fuels cause problems in the environment. But I also think it's important to say, what are we gonna do to all the people that make their living in, in you know, in, in Oklahoma for oil or in West Virginia or Western Pennsylvania for coal, we're not simply going to be able to take all of these people, relo relocate them to Phoenix, Arizona and make them educated office workers. So I think there's, there's, there's that argument that goes the other way, but the environmental lobby is very strong in this country and it tends to come from the Democrats more than the Republicans. So we'll see. We'll see. Wayne, thank you very much. I know it's late. Um, over there. Good luck tomorrow and good luck um, for your country going forward. We, um, um, you know, a strong partner to Australia, the US have been for a long time, a, a great ally. Um, so um, we've got great relationships as well. And I, you know, I owe you a couple of bottles of Australian wine as well. So to get that sorted. Wayne, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you for attending everyone. Um, we had, you know, uh, close to 200 people attending today. So that's that's fantastic. Next month, we're, we're talking about, um, you know, talking about China, Wayne, um, the relationship between China and Australia uh, with trade. There's been a number of developments that have happened um, recently. Um, and so we've got a couple of experts that are going to come and speak to um, everyone um, next month, which we will send out um, some invites to. Um, so that will be something to, to listen to. There have been a number of questions that have happened. We've run out of time today. Um, we will um, contact people directly and uh, provide some answers on those. Sorry, run out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Uh, thank you for everyone's attendance um, here today and, um, and have a magnificent day. All the best. Cheers. Thanks, Wayne.